despite all the claims, it's, it's supposed to be an objective science, but as you will learn, it is not. It is objective in the past, but it's never objective in the present. Nothing is objective in the present, right? You are told things before they are really verified. And you have to sort of believe things that you hear, but you teach it, so be careful. Listen critically. So, remember what, what I'm trying to do. I'm, of course, trying to teach you the standard model, but I want to do something else. There is a sort of little parallel course, and that is sort of a, a lesson how the discoveries are made, how the advances are made, and what really it means to construct a deep, fundamental, predictive, self-contained theory. And I don't know if I'm talking to the right audience, because the majority of you wants to do wrong physics. Either astroparticle physics or string theory or what, okay? Here I am to, to tell you that if you are after fundamental laws of nature, the good old particle physics is dealing precisely with that, okay? With, good, with all due respect to other fields. But then, I think you want to learn. I can see that, the questions you are asking. So the spontaneous symmetry breaking, this profound mechanism that we are trying to grasp, has two features. Who, this creed case was not so important, we are after continuous symmetries. And we started the Goldstone, the global symmetry, that will move us to the Higgs, which is the local symmetry. And there are two fundamental features here. One is the physics, and the other is the group theory. Or if you wish, even, even more fancy, the topology. There is even an interesting topology here. Topology of the of the manifolds that are associated with symmetry breaking, the vacuum manifold that we call. Now the physics in Goldstone and Higgs is completely different. They have nothing to do with each other. This is what you're gonna learn. It's sort of opposite physical phenomena. Goldstone and Higgs. The other, the topological, the group theory aspect is the same. And this is why I need to teach you both, okay, in this process. I want you to teach you the dependence on the group theory, on technical details. And then we have to be sure every time to extract the physics correctly, although the group theory changes. So if I want to understand physics, so physics, Goldstone and Higgs is different physics. But same group theory, same mass, let's call it same mass. The physics I've been trying to emphasize, you can capture all of the physics in this trivial, if you wish, the simplest, the unphysical example, the U1, in which case there is no group theory whatsoever, the symmetry just gets broken, right? The U1 was an example of a scalar field that transformed with a, some U1 charge, Q, that I took to be 1. And we wrote the Lagrangian, I don't want to write the kinetic energy, remember there was a potential uh, energy which was of this form. Well, I can write. There is a kinetic energy, kinetic energy. Let me write. Sometimes I put a half in the kinetic energy, sometimes a wall. Depends how I normalize my fit. That shouldn't confuse. Okay, if I put a half, for example, if I put a half and write like this, then I'm right at phi 1, phi is phi 1 plus i phi 2. I don't need to put the square root of 2 here, right? Sometimes it may happen that I put, or that you read in the book, that there is no half here. Then you would normalize it to keep the usual triangle of normalization. Okay. But that's a technicality. And we said the beauty of this case is that you could actually see what is going on, right? You can draw the picture. It is two-dimensional, this is V, phi 1, phi 2. Okay, phi 1, phi 2. And then I had a potential which looked like this. We noticed that there was a, 
equi potential surface, which was a circle, we call it a vacuum manifold, that the state of lowest energy was the set of all points, so that vacuum is the potential is at minimum, and this was a circle. This was one fundamental characteristic. So we suspected that there would be a massless excitation along this surface, telling us that it costs you no potential energy to go around. It costs you kinetic energy, of course, enormous kinetic energy, and you can live infinite kinetic energy. You can choose to live on a certain point, but it will cost you no potential energy to go around. And you suspect immediately a massless particle. Every time you see a flat direction, this is a flat direction, right? Potential is flat around here. If you are around, if you're moving around the minimum, then you will get a mass square, right? If you were on the maximum, you will get a second derivative to be negative. Here, the second derivative is simply going to be zero, and that's a mass. And we found out by writing phi, for example, as v plus h plus i g. This was a choice for a ground state. We found out that mh square or mh is square root of 2 lambda v and mg is 0. This is the celebrate number Wollstone boson. In order to see it, I said there is a choice of variables which is very convenient to see what is going on. Not so convenient to do calculations, okay. When you write phi, I could also write e to the ig over v, v plus h. Perfect is little summary of what we did to ask any questions. That, uh, if, if there was confusion, that has remained. Um, and now it's manifest, right? Because if I write this potential, this potential is only a function of This is the simple potential we wrote for the discrete. Case. We got the same potential, which is lambda over 4, 2EH plus A square square. Normally, in this case, if I write with these variables, I, there should be some G prime, OK? Or maybe let me call it G prime, if you don't mind, just not to confuse you. If I use this variable, then, of course, there is G in the potential, and there are interactions with G, and therefore it, 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 it's not trivial to show that these two different ways of writing the theory give the same physics, okay? But it can be shown rigorously. And I'll give you an example of what I mean by that. You can, you can, you can check certain things that you doubt, okay? In this case, in other words, you see immediately, you don't have to do the calculation that MG is zero. This is a convenient way of, of, of writing. And this captures basically all of the physics, which is based on spontaneous symmetry breaking situation when the charge does not annihilate. When the charge annihilate, does not annihilate the, uh, the vacuum, this would be the situation of symmetry being preserved. And in our case, Q phi zero is phi zero because phi carries charge. A vacuum is not a vacuum. Ground state is full of this strange charge. And we, this is supposed to be the world we live in, okay, filled with, with, with charge. Okay, spontaneous symmetry break. Every time this happens, this is a Goldstone theorem. Every time the charge does not annihilate the vacuum, you will get a massless excitation called very often called Bolson boson, Nambu boson boson would be correct. So this is the physics of spontaneous symmetry breaking of Goldstone mechanism. We are still doing Goldstone for one or two more lectures. I'm not sure.
Then in order to see the non-trivial mathematical aspects, to see the topology, we have to go to non-abelian symmetries. And there it turned out, what we could guess, or maybe it didn't turn out yet, we should do maybe a few more examples. The outcome will depend on the uh, scale of fields, not just on the theory. If you take a U1 case and you take a scalar field, this, the, the physics will be independent of what charge here it is. Suppose I take a charge two, there will still be spontaneous symmetry breaking, this will be non vanishing, okay. This guy there will be a factor of two, but you will have the same mass as excitation, okay. Some detail may change, but not the physical outcome in the U1 case. The choice of charge would not change the physics. Whereas in the case of non abelian symmetries, we will see it dramatically changes. So the first example was SO3 with a vector representation. Vector representation was, as I wrote it, as a, as a column. When you write it as a column, then phi goes into O phi, which is E. I can still write it E as a theta A T A phi. Notice that this is orthogonal transformation, real. Therefore, the, the thetas are imaginary, you see immediately. They're also Hermitian and traceless, okay, but they are imaginary, and that, of course, is the famous epsilon. Uh, what we mean is here, actually, it's a spin one representation of SU2? Yes, if you wish. Or I can just speak of SO3, I don't have to mention SU2. I like could have just said I have a SO3 in the vector. But this is equivalent to having a, a non abelian theory SU2. Well, at this point, really, SU2, remember? SU2 really makes sense when I introduce the spinner. SU2 is uh, 2 times 2. I mean, SU2, but this is not SU2, strictly speaking. Sure. At this moment, I'm talking about group theory. Uh, it's not here. No. Um, strictly speaking, this is SO3. We will introduce spinners, therefore, we will be interested in SU2. But, but, but if I don't say anything, it will be fair to say that this is SO3. This is. However, equivalent to SU2 with an adjoint representation. These two algebras are the same. Uh, can I just say this is a case where we have I to spin 1? Uh, SU2, yes, you can say that. You can say that because we, we generalize when we introduce SU2. I mean, how does SU2 start? This is O, O transpose equal O transpose O equal 1. And these are 3 times C. So it has nothing to do with SU2 at the first glance. What is SU2? SU2 is some doublet transforming. This will be SU2. Let's write doublet. So be doublet transforms as UD, where U, U dagger is U dagger U is 1. Determinant O is U1. Determinant O is U1 in SO3. And doublet has an upper lower component. It's a two times two unitary transformation. At first glance, they have nothing good with each other. The thing here is that TA, TB is I epsilon. I just repeat this trivial thing, but it's good to make sure that there is no confusion. These are the commutation relations of SU2. It turns out, actually, I should call this LAs, if you wish, not to some different generators, not to confuse. But it turns out LA, LB, as you know, this is SO3, is I, Epsilon, A, B, C, L, C. They're the same algebras. And therefore, it doesn't matter when I speak of algebras what, what language I use. It's very important when I talk of group theory, of, of topology of this, okay? It's, it's, SO2 is different from SO3, the covering spaces are different, and so on, okay? And LA, B, C is minus I epsilon A, B, C. These are the imaginary, Hermitian, traceless. They're always traceless. And these are Pauli matrices. What I do in SU2, if I have a doublet, I can induce an adjoint representation. I will change the notation. Sometimes I'll call it phi or A or sigma, whatever. 
A is a joint representation. Let's call it A to emphasize, which sounds like this. Where A is TA phi A. Okay, I use this phi A. I can use the same vector, one, two, three, and form out of it, right? These are three independent components. There's a three independent generator. I form a Hermitian traceless matrix. It's easy to see that this is equivalent to this. Okay, this is what we've shown. It comes out immediately in a trivial manner because I get a commutator, and commutator is given by epsilon APC. Right? When I expand, I get a commutator. After all, U is e to the i. So, now this answers your question now since you asked. Yes, I can speak of SU2 because I can introduce an adjoint representation in SU2, which is, which is, this is a generalization of a group. You know, mathematicians would, the, their representation is a different name, they associate with their representation. The group really SU2. We are cheating here in some sense. Our language is careless. SU2 means two times two unitary transformation. This is not anymore two times two unitary transformation on A. But I can build it out of two times two. I don't have ever to introduce anything else. I can build all the representation out of spin half. So it's good to keep the name SU2, right? I can, and this is very useful, I can do that, and I can do that in any SUN. I just have to learn the fundamental. And I will build that. That's a representation theory of, for physicists uh, how to use algebras. Notice we are dealing with algebras. I'm not worrying about But when I say here the transformation is the same, I'm, I'm looking for, I'm, I'm looking at small theta, right? I expand and I show it's the same. I'm not looking at large. All of the group space. The advantage of using this, and I want you to get familiar with this, is that you can generalize it immediately to any group. When I generalize it to any group when epsilon becomes f, of course, then the generators will become. Because this is simply uh, 1 or a plus i theta a ta a. And since a is built out of We have here T A T C Phi C. So we have T B Phi B plus I that A T A T C is I F A B C in general, right? T B is taken out Phi C. So see I reproduce the SU2 result, the transformation property is precisely the one given by the structure constants. But you can generalize to any. I've, I've written this a number of times. When you say Make sure, ask me uh, if you have. Yeah, and, uh, when you were saying that you generalize it for any group, do you mean. Do you SUN, any SUN. Do you mean that you. Okay, no. But any SUN, epsilon SUN, becoming not, F. Not any group, okay. Any SUN, sorry. I can go immediately to SUN from SU2 if I substitute epsilon with some FABC, right? Now it's any SUN. There is minus. Where? Before FABC. I don't think so. Oh, yes. Precisely. It will be minus because this is ACB. Yeah, thank you. So there will be a minus sign here. Or let's put like this, it's better. Which is precisely what I want. I want to argue that these are minus ABC are the uh, 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 generators in the, in the vector implementations. Okay, so the vector is a joint. We will be using this. This a joint is very useful because you don't want to remember the vector 
the corresponding representation of SU5. It's crazy. Which had what 24 elements? Who's gonna remember that 24 times 24 structure constant? But you will learn that it's very easy to construct a fundamental representation of any SU group. Mm -hmm. okay, I'll teach you. I'll teach you this eventually. We have to prepare you for physics beyond the standard model. So whatever formalism I uh, use, I will get the same result. Obviously, this is one and the same representation. What was the outcome here? I could have written phi as e to the i g a l a over v, 0, 0, v plus h. Notice that I can always write this. In some things, I'm overcounting, you may say. I've introduced h, one field. There are three generators, so I have three fields here. But one of the generators analyzes the vacuum, obviously. L3 acting on 5, 0 is 0. I've chosen the vacuum in the third direction, which means I can still rotate and around that axis. I can still have SO2. Okay, this is what we learned when we did the careful analysis. Okay? Again, these guys disappeared, the two of them basically disappear from the potential. The third one is not actually there. So if you wish to, to be consistent, you can write GI, LI, and then you can say I goes at 1 over 2. But you will not make a mistake if you sum over all of them, because 1 will give you 0. Okay, when you have a vector, that, that will always happen. So we got 2. We see immediately I have two broken generators. L1, 2, acting on phi 0 cannot give zero. And no linear combination can give zero because they act in different spaces. One is in the two three space, the other is in the uh, uh, one three space. This is very important to make sure that there is no linear combination. So I have two broken generators, we say, right? I have two generators, we do not annihilate the vacuum. I expect two, I don't know how to draw it. It's now a three dimensional thing. It's a it's actually, the Mecchio manifold is two-dimensional, but I will have to look in the three-dimensional space. It's, a, it's an S2, right? That we've done, I don't want to repeat everything. What I want to remind you here, that I have two, two broken generators. So in this case, two broken generators two number Goldstone bosons, which are G1 and G2, they disappeared from the, uh, from the potential. Right? When I write like this, phi transpose phi will, of course, eliminate. Okay, it took me some time to, uh, we lost the lecture, so it's good to, to remind us what we've learned. Well, you still may say, well, you didn't convince me that the group theory is, is non-trivial here. I have to take now another example. So let's take the same group, which now I can call SU2 because I take a doublet. And I want to show you that the symmetry breaking will not be the same. That was the symmetry breaking depends on the choice of the group, but equally on the choice of the scalar field that you use in this process. It has to be a scalar field, why? Let me see if you remember. Why do I always have to introduce scalar field? A lot of people didn't like that. People, people didn't like the fact that there were no fundamental scalar particles. Pion is not fundamental. So people didn't like this. They said, oh, this is ugly. You are introducing a scalar field. Why don't I use a fermion? There are fermions already <laughs> present in the theory. Or why don't I use a gauge boson to do spontaneous symmetry break? What was the argument, you remember? <laughs> yes, okay. We don't want to do that because we don't want to break rotation symmetry. We don't want to break Lorentz symmetry. So we have to use a spin zero particle or a scalar, if you wish, that does not transform under Lorentz. But we say we don't want to couple to the spin of particles. This new fit where We don't want to break Lorentz symmetry. No, I don't care what it, it starts like this. I don't want to break Lorentz symmetry because it's not broken. I just want to break the symmetries which are broken. Okay? 
tomorrow this may change. Tomorrow you say, well, you know, one of you may say, people thought of you of this anyway. You can imagine, okay, once the spontaneous symmetry breaking is introduced, people are willing to break anything. And of course, there has been long studies of how to break uh, uh, Lorentz symmetry. Then you will not use a scalar field. You use a spin or, or tensor or vector or whatever you like. But you and I, we are, we are not speculating. We are, we are doing uh, well uh, motivated science. Well, maybe you know, last few lectures we can speculate a bit. Okay, let's do the doublet to appreciate this point of topology changing when a group theory changes. The student doing Goldstone, all of these were global transformation. The tetas or alphas as I call this sometimes are constants, okay? There is no space time dependence. So let me do SU2 with a doublet representation that I'm going to call phi. So I will write the Lagrangian let me not write, let me now don't write, let me write a half. Right? This is invariant under S2, manifestly. Minus V of phi. And V of phi is lambda over 4. This is a group of rank one, right? The rank of SU2 is one. Cartan, there is just one. Member of the Cartan subalgebra, T3, we call it. It's easy to see that you will get only one invariant in your potential, okay? You can convince yourself. You know, you can always rotate phi in one direction. That you can do, like, I can rotate the vector in the z direction. I can also rotate the spinner to have only up or down components. And you will see immediately that there are no other invariants. For example, there could be invariant like this. Let me see if you're familiar with this invariant. Well, let me write like this, epsilon, where this is anti-symmetric tensor. Well, you are. You are familiar with this. This is the first thing you learned when you were studying spin. How do you find a spin singlet? By anti-symmetrizing up and down. Out of spin half, you were building spin zero and spin one. What was spin one? There was a symmetric combination, you agree? You were saying, I take spin half and spin half. Two times two is four. Four is one plus three. One is a singlet. What this is, by the way, if I write down if I write phi, it's phi up, phi down. What would this be? Phi up. This is an anti-symmetric scene, or I, sh I okay, anti-symmetric. So this is phi u phi d minus phi d phi u. The anti-symmetric combination of spin half. This, however, is zero because the field is a scalar field. It's a scalar, so these two commute. This is zero. But for example, if they were spinners, they wouldn't commute. I will get uh, uh, something on trivial, right? Majorana master. Very good. This will actually be a Majorana master, okay? I have just introduced en passant a fundamental aspect of SU2 group theory. And it is interesting that your first reaction it was to say to me, oh, we don't know this, okay? You're just not used to the notation, okay? There are two ways of writing invariance in SU2. One is taking a spin half and spin anti-half. That, of course, will give me spin zero. Spin half, spin anti-half. Or I take twice spin half when an anti-symmetric. If I symmetrize, I get spin one which will transform precisely as that vector. By the way, the notation of getting a spin 
let me see if you're familiar with that, that's pin one. This is normally how we write. The sandwich Pauli matrices between these transforms as a vector Vi or phi i as I call it, I don't want to introduce the, uh, uh, well, I called it phi i before. Have you ever shown this? We can maybe have you do that as a whole work. But you can guess immediately that you are going to get that because the way the Pauli matrices commute, you will get epsilon symbol. Because of the but, okay. Right, what will, what will this transform to? This will transform as phi dagger, u dagger, sigma i, little digression on group theory phi. And then when I go with u, which has Pauli matrices, I will have a commutation which will give me the epsilon symbol. I won't do it now. So you can imagine, you can say, oh, you can take a different invariant. You can take this square that's also invariant. You will see that you will never get a different independent quantity. They will all be either zero or they will be related to this because rank one will have only one. Uh, and the easiest way to see, go to the basis where phi is zero times phi down. You can always do that. Rotate. Let me not write more this. Okay, I just wanted to wet your mouth. I think this could be a nice homework that you guys sort of redo as you do in the, in the simple language. Oh. When we take that the symmetric combination of the spin and half, uh, we get zero, but... Uh, no. Only if it's scalar, we get zero. Mm -hmm. Only in this case, we get zero because it was a scalar they commute, not in general. As Nicolas just said, it will be fundamental for fermions. Okay, this is how we will write the Majorana mass term. I mean, okay. I mean, what what is the spin representation for uh, for this in SU two, not the Lorentz group? So, uh, uh, well, then it's interesting for Lorentz group. We have to generalize that. We'll come back to it. I'm not doing Lorentz at the moment. We'll come back to that. No, so I mean, discuss the fermions. I'm going to come back to this question. But I don't want to talk about it now. No, my question is. Uh, when, when we take the anti-symmetry components of two spins, spin half, in the SU2, ju just, just let, like, look at SU2, what we will, will get? We will get, uh, okay. we'll get a scalar. We'll get a spin zero. We'll get the spin zero, but... I mean, you used to write it like this. So, so, but this is how you used to write it. So let me just make sure that I can write this as phi up, phi down. Or I can write it as up down. Or I can write it as this and this. Now so this confuse you, okay? Yeah, this is just the notation, so okay? You agree. You used to write with, uh, you know, bra and cat, uh, upper and lower. So this would be the spin zero state. It's Properly normal. Is it, is it the same as the, that, that representation of that? Yeah, no. This no. no, this is phi dagger phi, this is, well, it, it, it's end up, but this is, yeah, this is also <laughs> a, a scalar, yes. Okay, the reason but is, this okay. This is a uh -huh. scalar in, in a triplet, maybe, and that okay, scalar uh, is a singlet, maybe. A little digression on group theory, I, I end up having to do this, I always hope that I won't have to do this, but I end up having to do this here, it's interesting, that somehow I, I think I should teach the course. I would, like, you know, I would teach a group theory completely different from my. Program. I would just make you make you learn as you do and nothing else if if necessary, just to make sure that you don't walk out not knowing. Uh, for example, what is the point about as you do? When we have S U N uh, groups, right? Then of course these are complex transformations. So, for example, in S U three, as you know, there is a uh, let's say a fundamental representation which is three component fundamental or phi then there is also phi star and these are different representations completely they have nothing to do with each other in SE2 this is not true, SE2 is kind of real it's pseudo real we say it's strange because phi transforms 
D is U5. Then you say, oh, okay, phi star does not transform the same way. It transforms as U star. Go back to SU2. SU2. So you say, oh, but U star is different from U, you could think. But notice the following. Take I sigma 2 phi star. How does this transform? It transforms as I sigma 2 U star phi star. Correct? Now I'm going to commute I sigma 2 with U star. What is U star? It's e to the minus i t a star theta a. Now t 1 3 star is equal to t 1 3. These are Pauli matrices, agreed? t 2 star is minus t 2. I've written so many times, these are Pauli matrices, okay? So what happens? So look what happens when I want to move. Sigma 2 here, what's going to happen? Sigma 2 commutes with T2. But I have a minus sign here. Minus sign here, it's very important. Minus sign, so it becomes plus. So in the case of 2, you're, you're with me? Okay, I will just say this. In the case of 2, I'm going to have a plus sign here. Because this has a minus sign, but they commute. Take one and three. This is minus here, but they anti-commute. So this is very easy to see that this is u, i sigma two phi star. Is this clear? Please check it. Mentally or writing down? This takes three seconds. So make sure that, that this stays with you forever. Strictly speaking, there is no difference between five and five star. There are no truly complex representation of SU2. All I have to do is rearrange the components of, of this five star. In other words, if phi is a doublet, which I write as phi up, phi down, it also, I sigma 2 phi star, which is phi down star, minus phi up star, this is also a doublet. The, the complex representation, as long as I rearrange the elements, okay, I, I put this up and I put this down, okay, there is a minus sign, they transform the same way. Notice they transform the same way. This is a double. The same U transformation. And this is why two invariants, this is why they are they're basically one invariant. When I wrote, okay, let's now, let's erase this, uh, Let's erase the triplet. You remember it. In the triplet case, I should oh, I should have just in the SS3 with vector, we found out it was broken down to SU2 with phi zero, which was a vector. Okay, this is what we should remember. So you see, if it is true that that well, actually you know this, and somehow I think you know it better in the Lorentz case, because for example, in the Lorentz case, you know that if psi is the spinner, so is psi conjugate. In Lorentz group, your first homework, right? It's psi transforms as lambda, let's say, Lorentz transformation, okay, psi. 
Psi C also transforms as lambda Psi C, right? What is Psi C? C, Psi bar transpose, right? This is C gamma zero Psi star. Notice. There is some rearrangement, but there is Psi star. So even in Lorentz group, this is true. You ask about the Lorentz group that I don't want to talk now, but actually, since I'm making this aggression, I can as well say it because to, to remind you that you know that that psi and psi star transform basically the same way as long as you rearrange them. And notice that we, you and I take psi i gamma 2 gamma 0. So this becomes actually i gamma 2 psi star. But gamma 2 is made out of sigma 2. It's precisely the thing I'm writing here in the SC2 space. Not surprising. After all, Lorentz group is basically rotation. There are boosts. But boosts are like complex rotation, remember? The, the same thing, they transform with the same Pauli matrix is only the, the you get an imaginary Euler angle. You can write that way. We we'll have to re repeat all of this. We have to really learn it well when we speak of Majorana neutrinos, which, which presumably Alexei like already spoke about. So let me say. Yes, sir. Sorry, that's correct. Just two different ways to write the uh, variant of the spin zero. In, uh, yes. In okay. it, it's just mathematics, I mean, but it, it turns yeah. out that it's continuous sound physical. Well, it's profound. It just tells you that there is only one invariant, okay? This is very important, okay? With the scalar, with the spinner, there will be two invariants, okay? With the scalar, there's so one thing you will learn. The fact that this is a pseudo-real representation makes the potential very simple. There is just one term I can write because this is equivalent to everything else. When we work on spinners, we will find out that there are actually two different ways of writing the master. One is the Dirac master, side by side. Well, before I... You, what will turn out here that there is a... This is invariant under Lorentz group. You agree? We can call it Lorentz invariant. <coughs> Easy to see. <coughs> there is also a Majorana invariant, which is side transpose, C side. And it's not surprising that this is invariant because there is psi star here, but psi star is related to psi. They transform the same way, basically, up to the C. Maybe to take a long time, so I don't have to lose the main time, but I need to ask uh, that what's the relationship between having the group Cartan elements and having a number of invariants? Are they the same numbers or in similar representation case we have two uh, various invariants? Yes, you will see that in the, we'll, we'll do, I'll, I'll show you this, right? For example, in, in, in SU3 rank is two and you will have two invariants which are independent, besides that there is this correspondence. But like in spinner representation, we still have uh, SU2, but we wrote down there two in Um. Well, in spinners, I have I have to speak of Lorentz group. So I have to, once I speak of the Lorentz group, I have raised the rank, right? It's not. But let me I, let, let me come back to the. I, okay, maybe this analogy. Just to, I wanted to tell you that you know this that this is invariant. But I don't want to talk about the Lorentz group now. But if we say that Lorentz group is decomposing to SU2 times SU2, that's why... For example, think, think of, it's a good way to understand the Lorentz is to imagine that we live in Euclidean space. And then it will be a sort of, Lorentz becomes Vikovsky, it becomes a simple symmetry, it becomes a Euclidean symmetry, which is SU2 times SU2. You would have really a, an SO4, and that's SO4. It has actually two, uh, it's rank two. And that will correspond to two invariants, okay? But uh, we are jumping ahead of ourselves, so let's stick to SUN groups. It will be true what I'm saying. In SUN group, you will see nicely how the rank corresponds to the number of variants we can write. Then we'll do this on examples, okay? So here, was this clear, please? Okay. 
And this is the reason why one of the invariants, phi 2, I wrote epsilon, but epsilon is I sigma 2. So we don't write epsilon. We normally, because it's easier than to check what is going on. This is here. One invariant that disappeared. OK. You can convince yourself any which way, and maybe, as I said, I'll give you a homework to show that. Let's erase this. And have you do the homework. So, obviously, the vacuum manifold now is set of all. What is this manifold? Well, notice that phi, phi u, phi down, I can write this phi 1 plus i phi 2 real components. I used to write them like this. Phi 3 plus i phi 4. Notice the doublets are bigger than the triplets. In some sense, okay, it's a funny way. Where it looks more cumbersome when I write a triplet, I have to write it as some kind of a joint of presidential U dagger. This has only three elements, this has four elements, okay? And this is why actually the vacuum manifold is bigger. So phi dagger phi is simply sum one to four phi i square. So what is this? Let's call this three. Okay, just, it's not so important, just to. Uh, uh, I will, by rotation, choose phi zero, zero V. If you want, let's put G for my vacuum. I like to use this vacuum. I'll, I'll show you some example how the choice of the vacuum doesn't matter. I'll show it when it's easy. When it's not easy, I won't show it. I leave it for, for you to check. This is typically right, the difference between. The teacher and the student. The teacher does an easy thing, right? And the students have to do other work in the homework. That's, that's how it works. This is obvious. If you are not, if it's not obvious, you please show it. That you can always find some U so that this is. So what will happen now? It's very easy to see here that all the generators T A on phi zero are non-zero. All three of them. They're Pauli matrices. And there can be no linear combination that gives zero because they act in different spaces. There is no sense of taking linear combinations. You see, we, we shouldn't be surprised. The vacuum manifold is different. Remember when it was a circle, there was one broken generator, one number Goldstone boson. Then we got S2, which is sort of like two circles, if you wish. There are two different directions in which the potential is orthogonal to each other, equipotential. So we got two number Goldstone boson. We expect here a different situation because the vacuum manifold is S3. We see immediately that the choice of the scalar field influences the symmetry breaking. If it's S3, I have now three different directions where the potential is equipotent. Uh, 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 it's invariant. I would expect three number of some bosons without doing a calculation. Okay. But at least I can see that there are immediately, because it's S3, I expect three broken charges. And, 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 and they are. So you see how I reason, how, you, how do you build up a theory, you know? Tomorrow you want to cook up a new theory, okay? And you would say, well, I will start with some gauge group, and then you know that the gauge group has to be broken into something. You know it either from experience or from the laws of nature. For example, whatever I start with, 
at very high energies, if I start with some gauge group, it has to be broken to the standard model gauge symmetry because this is correct now. We have checked this at lab with a fantastic precision at LFC is confirming, confirming it found the Higgs and so on. So then you say, aha, let me now think which Higgs I'm going to use so that I reproduce the symmetry breaking. Okay, this is the, the challenge. Because we see immediately, how will I see that explicitly? Well, we will write phi. From here I can write phi as e to the i g a t a over v. Zero v plus h. I have four fields here, you agree? Actually, if we span it, if I write this I plus I G A T A over V, zero V plus H, notice it has to be one over V for dimensional reasons, you agree? I'm summing a repeated index, okay? There it goes from one to three. What will I get? Let me see if you can see it quickly. <coughs> D3 is, is off diagonal, so let me do it mentally. For the small one, I will get V plus H minus I, G3 over 2. You agree? T8 is. You agree? Sigma 3 will give me, it has a minus sign in this corner. So this. I will get, what will I get here? T1. I will have I G1 over 2. There is an I here, and T1 is 1. And then T2 has a minus I with plus, I will get plus G2 over 2. Notice I got four components, okay? In other words, in other words, look at the way I wrote the doublet here. Uh, phi 3 is V plus H. 5, 4 is G minus G3 over 2. 5, 1 is G2 over 2. And 5, 2 is minus G1 over 2. This is precisely a doublet with four real components when I write for small values of E. But remember, the choice of variables, the way you write it, it's up to you. Whenever you have this exponential, it's very hard to do calculations, you will learn. Okay? Not surprising, because then you get derivatives, okay? But what is nice here, you agree, what is nice, the potential now is lambda over 4. This guy disappeared, phi dagger 5 kills j's. There is phi dagger. Well, uh, why don't I write here phi dagger five, if you wish. This is a phi dagger five is zero v plus h e to the minus i g a t a over v e to the plus i g a t a over v zero v plus h. Agree. I mean, after all, this is you, so I'm going to get you dagger. So notice they disappear. Where did they go? They went into the derivatives. Okay, they are hidden here. I'm not going to lose them. It's just a matter of writing. But what it tells you that there are three massless number works on both. We break everything here. We break everything here, precisely. If I want to break everything now I've learned, I better take a double. If I don't want to break uh, everything, I take a triplet. But we said that rank would not be changed by... No, we never said that. No, on the contrary. I said, it will depend which scale I use. If you use a joint, the rank will not be broken. Ah. Hey. That's obvious. In the case of a joint, that's obvious because here the, the generator acts as a commutator and therefore it can never break Cartan. I can always take vacuum expectation value to be diagonal. I can take the, 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 the vacuum, if you wish, in the Cartan subspace. So Cartan won't be broken. But that's particular to a joint and only to a joint. Okay, it's, 
Well, there may exist some very big other representation in principle. I shouldn't. Okay. I, sorry, I take it back. I remember that in SU5 there was a large representation. Something like the little miracle can happen, okay. So not only a joint, I'm sorry. It's the simplest representation that automatically preserves the rank. You don't have to compute anything. So the question of, of, of when I study it is the question whether I want to break the rank or not. I get three, so GI, GA, A123 are the number of Goldstone Boson. Notice the potential as a function of H looks the same as the discrete guy. I promised you. You do this discrete guy and the guy that remains, I will call the Higgs particle. Why? Because I will end up with the same potential. Okay, just as long as I write lambda over 4, in that case, I go to V over H. P I manifest it. So I have the famous result MH squared is 2 lambda V squared. Okay, why now I can call it the Higgs? You can imagine the only difference between the global case and the local case is that theta is that u becomes a function of x, but it doesn't change the potential. Potential does not care whether the symmetry is global or local. Only only kinetic energy cares. Okay, keep that in mind. But okay, you, we will see that. So if you get the local symmetry, then those gold sound bosons become the gauge bosons of that local symmetry. Do we mean that? I don't want to say that. You're jumping your head. Um. But at least there are gold sound bosons that we will somehow need to care about in the kinetic term that affect the diagrams we draw every calculation we have? Um, <coughs> well, if you have no questions here, we can actually start a gauge case. But let me see before I further answer your questions. Let me see if you want to ask me something about the global case. So remember, what I do is here, it's hidden here, in my way of writing. This is extremely useful in understanding what is going on. I can immediately read off the physical fields. I can immediately see who is the Higgs, who are the Goldstone bosons. Well, I can know everything, you agree. The trouble is, it is also at the same time a lousy notation because I don't know how to compute. What I'm going to get, I'm going to get derivatives here, and I, I hate derivative interactions. Okay. So I'm using it because I want to understand the physics. When I need to start computing, I'll have to rethink everything. But that will come later. So let's agree. This we, we will call this. A unitary gauge, you will see in the case of, of gauge symmetry. So we can even call it here a unitary uh, <coughs> gauge or the unitary uh, form of phi, whatever. Okay. Extremely useful to see what is going on. But if you want to take now the kinetic term local it's better to use the linear one. Okay. Yeah, because you, you keep G's in the interaction, okay? The thing is, okay, the here the, the interesting thing is to appreciate, okay, this is group theory. You see, the reason I'm varying the fields in the same group, algebra or SU2, is to show you how the topology and the group theory, how, how the choice of group theory influences the topology and the symmetry breaking changes, okay? But the physics is the same. You're learning nothing new about the physics. I have three broken generators here. There are three broken generators. They do not annihilate vacuum. This vacuum carries all the SU2 charges. It's full of SU2, okay? And I got three number Goldstone bosons. I've ruined the theorem in this example. We'll do some other examples, so maybe we don't have to do a formal proof. 
or maybe we will we'll see it depending on the time. But I think you will appreciate it even without writing the formal proof. The theory says every time there is a broken generator, there will be a corresponding massless oxidation. That will also tell you. You can read it from the topology of the mechanism. And if the way I introduce it, okay, at this point, you and I should not be talking about the topology. We are doing simple. And it's good to, to, to add a little mathematical formalism. I can raise it if there are questions, okay? We can get even more formal. You will see that. The three sphere that has three independent directions, so there is three broken generators, so there is three numbers. Right. Just think about that. Right? And they are independent because they act in different spaces, so you don't have to worry. You can try to write one linear combination gives you zero, you will see that you will not find it, okay? I don't want to even three, try to... Sorry. In the case of SO3, we have the, the two sphere as a vacuum manifold. Right. So and we got, right, and we got two number goals from both of Precisely. We can read off from there. We can root from the dimension of the vacuum manifold through this. Because that tells you, you know, when, they, when the dimension of the vacuum manifold was one circle, you had one broken generator, okay? That, that's what it corresponded to, okay? And you see, I'm writing in this notation manifestly using that. It has to do with the, with, the, with the complexity of the manifold, topology of the manifold, it has to do with the broken generator, because with every broken generator, I can associate here a field. If the generator is not broken, then there is no, and that's why with the vector there were only two goals of it, which was okay because there were three fields all together. And that was, th there is always one, remember, when we have symmetry breaking, there is always this guy that lives here. We are finding always an one and the same result, and I'm going to call it from now on, well, I already started, the Higgs field. When you break the symmetry, there will always be the field whose mass is proportional to that scale of symmetry breaking, okay, that you call the Higgs. But we should be careful because in the case of global symmetry, there is no real Higgs. Higgs has been the language used for the breaking of gauge symmetries, okay? However, once again, the potential does not care whether the symmetry is global or gauge. So therefore, in the potential, we will always get one massive guy that behaves like our Higgs. And that will be precisely the Higgs of the standard model, you will see. Now, to, to, to emphasize the point, you know, because now Nicolas said, asked, well, why don't I, then, then I should maybe use this when I want to compute and not the exponential form, it will, you know, I want to get rid of these complicated interactions, okay? And remember, go back to the U1 case. So we said, I can write phi as V plus H plus IG. Then the potential would be lambda over 4, V plus H square plus G square minus V square everything square, which is lambda over 4, 2VH plus H square plus G square square, which will give me lambda over 4, 4V four square H square plus 4VH h squared plus g squared plus h squared plus g squared everything squared. That was in the U1 case when I kept the g. Without the g, this was in, in this. If I use the unitary sort of representation, unitary way of writing, I will have a potential which is lambda over 4, 4v square h square plus 4v h cube plus h to the fourth. No g. And you say, how can these theories be equivalent? You can ask me, okay? No, uh, you didn't ask me, but you could. Look, I get g to the fourth here. You don't have g to the fourth here. So what is going wrong, you may say? Remember, in this case, there are additional interactions. There are interactions of G in the, the, the derivative. There was, a, there was a d mu G over V coupled to H squared plus G squared and so on and so forth. So, so it, th there could be an equivalent. And 
just to just to show you, you could you could say, well, look, I'm gonna go look at the small momenta when this is going to zero. How in the world will I get? How will then g to the fourth? So in other words, in this particular case, I will have this interaction. Let me write it like this. G, 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 G. What is it going to cancel against? Take a small momentum situation, and then you conclude, well, you are wrong, you could tell me. I will never get that result. However, There is also this diagram when, when, when momentum goes to zero. Let me draw this as a straight line, although actually it's a scalar field. Call it H. You agree that there will be this diagram. I have an interaction H G squared. Then I have a propagator. The propagator is 1 over Q squared minus MH squared. I said, let's look what happens for when Q is small. It turns out that this diagram cancels this diagram completely. You could maybe leave it as an exercise, OK? It's not so important that you do it, but it's important that you understand it. You should really trust the theorem I'm claiming here. The physics does not depend on the variables you're using. Are not the same gigs, right? Sorry? Uh, the G's in the first and second way of writing, they are. No, no, I, I'm, I'm looking at this particular. Forget this. It's one and the same G. I'm just showing you, if I do this unitary form of writing, there will not be G to the fourth ever mm -hmm. for small momenta. So you're saying, how can the world can be equivalent? The, the point is that in this picture, there is no G to the fourth either. So you must be very careful you're saying, oh, look, there is a g to the fourth interaction here. Mm -hmm. For small momenta, there is also g square h. You have to sum these two diagrams, and they add to 0. Okay? We won't do it here now. It's not the moment. But you can see that it will happen, because mh squared depends on lambda. This depends on lambda, and so on. Okay? We have to put the symmetry factors, factors of y. But the, 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 this, is, this is proportional to lambda. Notice there is lambda here, and lambda here, lambda square. But in, in mh square is lambda v square. Forget the factors. Notice that lambda, lambda square over lambda, they give me one lambda. At every vertex there is lambda v. OK, well, let me just spend a few seconds. So I'm using this notation. And look at this diagram, we'll have lambda v square, because there are two vertices with lambda v square, you agree? Mm -hmm. And then it will have 1 over lambda v square from the propagator of ma square, which is lambda lambda. This is also lambda. Well, I have to check the signs. And the sign here, this has a factor of i. Uh, minus i from the uh, Feynman rules. So I will have here minus i, minus i from here. I have i from the propagator, but there is a minus sign here. So I have plus i. OK? I take the interaction, multiply with minus i. Minus i, minus i. i from the propagator. This goes with the opposite sign. These guys actually cancel each other, you think? This happened in the low energy, but when we go to the high energy, do we will get two physical theories or we will? Well, what will happen at high energy is this will not cancel anymore. You agree? Mm -hmm. They will not cancel because there will be Q squared here. But in the unitary uh, form, there was the mu g over v coupled to h squared, to g squared, and whatnot. 
then of course I have to take that into account, okay? There will be momentum dependence, so I have, to, I, I have to expand it in momenta. It's more complicated, but yes, of, yes, this is what was shown exactly in the, in the 60s. People like uh, Weinberg, Callan, Gross, and so on have studied this and shown the exact, the, the, the invariance of the S matrix, okay? You can show it to all orders of perturbation theory. You will get the same physical result. In case of gauge series, it's easy to see that because that's just a choice of gauge. Here, there may be some doubt because I'm not just changing a gauge, I'm changing the way I'm writing the field. The result, however, is, as I'm, I'm just illustrating in one case how a miracle happens. You would think that you have G to the force, but you don't have it. You go to non zero momenta, you will have it, but you will have it in the other picture also. Because then there is manifestly momentum dependent interaction. Calculations get more complicated. If this was a formal course on field theory, I would do this. It would be nice that we do this example and show how, in the Goldstone case, that would be a wonderful thing to see explicitly. Order to order, we get the same result. I'm spending a lot of time on the Goldstone case because there is a deep physics here with the hope that one day we may actually find the Goldstone boson. Strictly speaking, this is speculation what I'm doing here because the only symmetry that we know is broken in nature is the, is the local gauge symmetry. Okay, that's the only example there is. So, uh, uh, even writing like this introduces some momentum dependent interaction, but uh, here uh -huh. there is no momentum independent interaction. So, like in the derivative terms. Still get no, there is no derivative. What do you mean derivative? No, uh, I mean, no, I wrote like this. The interaction is momentum independent. You read it off from the potential. No, but if I put it on the Lagrangian in the kinetic term, you will get you will get to one half d mu uh, g square plus d mu h square. Across terms? Mm -hmm. No, no. You will not have a derivative interaction. This is what is what is important. I mean, d mu five simply, or well actually, I call it five, is d mu h plus i d mu g. I'm glad you asked. I sort of, I, I, I thought you saw it. So d mu five square is d mu h square plus d mu g squared. No, no, this is just... A constant will not do anything in the, in the kinetic energy, right? Here I only shifted H field by constant, the kinetic energy doesn't give a damn about it. It cares when I write it exponential, of course. This may have been complicated, it may have been messy, okay? It's not so important if you didn't grasp it. You can ask me, if you wish. Otherwise, just trust me that the result is independent of what notation. Right? It's, it's a sort of hand waving, not a precise calculation illustration of the fact. Well, I can. No. I wanted to say something more. I'll have to do it, but let's do it. We'll do the Higgs mechanism, and I'll come back to the gold stone. There, there is more I can say here. And it's irresistible. We do hope that maybe there is a gold stone boson, the axiom that everybody's looking for. Or some people hope for myron, a goldstone boson associated with a lepton uh, number breaking and so on. Okay, well, we don't know. But just just to prepare the lecture for tomorrow, what will happen if I gauge U1? Now that I have it on the blackboard, what will be the difference? The only thing that the Lagrangian would be this. Right? 
the potential will be the same, you agree? I, I said it in words many times, but it's obvious. And then there will be, of course, Maxwell energy, kinetic energy, which is irrelevant at the moment for me, just to remember that the gauge field propagates right because d mu is d mu minus ig. Let me call this g, not e. I don't want to bring you one of electromagnetism. This is some other u1. G a mu. We have a few minutes, so we can see. Since since you asked about gauge, let's 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 say it, and then let's be tomorrow more systematic. Nicola, we have mass term for the gauge field, like g square, b square, something like that. No. Mm -hmm. No, they can. Ah, there will be at the end. Oh yes, yes. Sorry. Oh, I thought you wanted me to write down a, a gauge mass term. No, I can't do that. Yes, well, you see it immediately. What's going to happen, I'm going to choose again phi. Uh, let me write it like this. So again, the potential is the same, right? It's just V of H. So mg is zero. This is still correct, you agree? Um, But d mu phi is what? Is d mu h plus i d mu g over v d mu d d mu what am I right? D mu five first. Is D mu H plus I D mu G over V V plus H So why don't I write the total D mu five? Minus I G A mu correct? times e to the ig over v. Maybe it would be better if I put v plus h here. e to the ig over v. You following me? So what I get one half d mu phi square is notice this is real so I'll get one half d mu h square kinetic energy for h then there is this extra piece which is plus um, I will write like this I d mu g not, I don't need d mu g minus g a mu square 1 plus v over h square. I've derived by v, so this is 1 plus h over v. I took V over out. So I think this is correct what I wrote, but who knows? H over V? Yeah, maybe it's better H over V. If disaster would be V over H, you know. It's sort of exploding when H goes to zero. We don't want that. Everybody sees this? I get the kinetic energy for H. I have a kinetic energy hidden here for G, of course. So let's write this a little more. We went to the Higgs mechanism. 
We took you one gauge. And therefore, this is very interesting. One dmu phi squared, the kinetic energy now for phi became highly non-trivial. There is a propagation of H field, well, that we expected. There is a propagation for G field, as we expected. And then there are various pieces, right? There is an interaction. Let me not write all of them today. This is not what I want. There will be a non-trivial, uh, even here, notice, there will be one plus, let's keep this H over V squared. Then there will be this piece is interesting. There is a cross piece. Well, I can write it. Minus, just to emphasize, there is a minus sign G A mu V D mu G 1 plus H over V squared. And then there is this piece that Nicholas told us will happen. A mu, A mu, 1 plus H over V squared. Now this is very interesting, this piece. When I keep one only. What I got is, this is a celebrated Higgs mechanism, I managed to do it. You see, once you do the Wolfson, the result comes in one second, or five minutes. That this is another nice way of seeing the symmetry broken, the gauge field picked up a mass. MA. And remember what I said, the only mass scale in this series is V. So whatever mass I get, it's always going to be proportional to this V. It's G times V. same problem because notice that I have a, a, a G field. The way I wrote it, or I wrote it as an exponential. Well, K. Okay. Well, first you, there are things we should we should ask before we come to that. But but yes, yes, you you are you're getting there. Yeah. But the first funny thing will happen, what is the physical implication of A getting a mass? Okay, but if what, 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 what happened to A? He had two degrees of freedom, and now got three degrees of freedom. How can I get an extra degrees of freedom? You know, I, I'm good, but not that good. Right? It's like, it's like taking a a pigeon out of the head where there was a flower, I don't know. I've, I've really done magic, I've created a degree of freedom out of nothing, you know. It's a big thing, I'm going to create life. This is even more dramatic yes. for us, you know, it's changing the laws of nature. It is one of the new fields, but I don't know which one. H or G, that degree of freedom, transfer. Yeah, right. Okay, that's going to be a discussion. We, we, today there is no sense to make you suffer. Today it's time to wrap it up. We have to now be very careful and study this. What we have to show, if we are right, that somewhere the degree freedom will have to disappear. We cannot get extra degrees of freedom. And the thing is, you can guess it. That's why I wrote it like this. I wrote like this. But remember, I have a asymmetry. Therefore, I can write phi goes into e to the minus i g over v phi and that's v plus h I can eliminate the reason I can eliminate because a mu changes before I couldn't eliminate it there was no way I could eliminate that field because that was not a symmetry but now it is a symmetry you see now phi is simply v plus h ok we'll be careful tomorrow 
will repeat this consistently. All I have to remember that mu changes. The mu changes into mu minus i, no, without i, uh, d mu g over v. Or oh, uh, there is one over g. There is always one over g when we do the gauge transformation. Okay. Alpha here is simply g over v. I'm using the fact that I can take any alpha function of x, anything I do. So I can also use it in terms of my field g of x. I'm, I'm saying that alpha of x is g of x over v. And this is this magical tree. Lo and behold, I'll eliminate g. I make it disappear. Well, it entered here. You see, it entered into a mu. It's, it's sort of, it's g that gave it its extra degrees of freedom. We, we use the language that a eats, becomes fat. It was skinny, it was a photon without mass, and it eats this g. Is that the same thing? Uh, I think Randy talked about Schrodinger and mechanism, but in the reverse direction, that we discovered that it's actually caged by. Uh, this no, this is not a Stuka, this is opposite from Stuka mechanism. Because if I do this by eliminating G, Nicolas already noticed that. I'm gonna have all the problems that the Broca theory had. And therefore I will fail. This is this is this smart. The, the, you see, I'm I'm too smart for my own good, okay, or, or Weinberg was, let's say, and Higgs and these guys, okay. Weinberg worked like this, and Weinberg is not completely stupid, as you and I know. Okay, this is a problem sometimes of being, of being too smart for your own good. That he decided to eliminate G because G is not there. He says, why should I work with G? That field is not there. I can see immediately I have this gauge freedom. I just throw it away. That was a disaster. We can't work with the theory. We got the bad propagator, okay, and the theory is badly non renormalizable Everything you compute averages more and more in perturbation theory. There is nothing you can do if you, if you eliminate it. He actually tried when at Hoft in 1971, 72, proved that the theory can be renormalized. What Hoft did, okay, he said, no, I'll keep G. Well, it looks stupid. He said, well, if I keep G, I'll restore gauge invariance, just like the photon. I use more degrees of freedom so that I can uh, live with gauge invariance. That will come later, okay? That we will uh, study carefully. Then it becomes similar to what you call the Stuckelberg mechanism. If you keep G, uh, Stuckelberg many years before he suggested to introduce this G, he was going to just put it there. Put it there. Put an extra degrees of freedom that can never be produced. Just like you put the longitudinal degrees of freedom or for the uh, time-like degree of freedom for the photon, write it there, put it in, and then fix the gauge. So that you can have only two physical degrees of freedom, but it's more convenient for you, strangely enough, to have this extra degrees of freedom and then to have these Lagrange multipliers, if you wish, okay. So we have to learn how to eliminate G and then we have to learn that that was a mistake. But it's very important to eliminate G to be able to understand, uh, to read off the physics. Uh, uh, this is why it's often called unitary or physical gauge. This, this way of... Uh, so our task is, okay, we have a lot of things still to do. You can see before I actually teach you the physics of the standard model, we have to now complete the Higgs mechanism and see the analogy between the two abelian, non-abelian cases. And I also want to show you, because I, 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 I used to puzzle me when I was a student, I was struggling with that. How do I recapture, to see explicitly, how do I recapture a, a ghost? Or how do I uh, uh, revive a ghost? Or how do I re resuscitate it? You know, it's, it's been crucified, okay? We, we assassinated, we eliminated the G field when the symmetry is gauged. Now, suppose that I go to the global limit. How do I get it back? I should get it back, right? It was there. It would be interesting to see that, okay? We wanna, we, I will pursue the, the, the physics of the Goldstone so that you have a more complete picture of symmetry breaking. Symmetry breaking, as we know now, is, is, is maybe more fundamental than the 
interactions we started with. You know, it all started on the same weak interaction, but we got much more. These are great theories that give you for free more than it's good. Okay. Any questions? That you ask a lot, you can say. So, anyway, we can stop the public part. <laughs>